Okay, so take it away, Lou. All right. Um, here's a, a reference I clipped in, in case you're interested. This paper came out recently, and she gave a uh, talk yesterday, which I didn't get to, um, but you'll find it if you look <laughs> up uh, YouTube's on by Mina on a gotcha, you'll probably find her talk. Um, this paper is entitled Not Categorification from Mirror Symmetry. Uh, there are going to be two more uh, installments of the, uh, this is part one. And uh, as you see from the description, it uses uh, lots of interesting things, uh, both in mathematics and in string theory. And she claims to categorify uh, invariants corresponding to all of the classical Lie algebras using her methods. Uh, and what she does seems to be interrelated with Ben Webster's work and other people's. So this is, uh, mm. this is one, one paper you might be interested in if you want to see what, what the physicists are doing with not invariants recently. Mm. I wouldn't try to talk about this, but maybe we could, uh, could get she talk Mina about it? Or, or someone to give us a talk in this seminar about this work. I was proposing that I, uh, to myself anyway, but I thought I'd air it with you that I could write to her and ask her if she'd give us a talk. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll give it a try. Yeah. Uh, you know, okay. we haven't got any talks so far for Friday. I, I don't know if she'd talk this Friday, but I'll write no. to her later today and see okay. when she'd be yeah. interested. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the uh, arrow polynomial for a while. And then if I still have some time, I'm going to start talking about Kovana homology and uh, and in an, in a second talk, I will talk about Kovana homology for virtuals. So you might recall the bracket polynomial extends to virtuals in the usual way. Um, and when you do that, it has interesting properties. For example, and we've been over this ground before, you can make examples like this, which have unit Jones polynomial. And so you, one would like to prove that this is in fact not of genus zero, that it really is a non-trivial virtual knot. It's not hard to see that it's non-trivial, but to see that it's a non-trivial virtual knot means you have to go beyond the Jones polynomial. And we did this using the uh, index polynomial in an earlier talk. And I'm going to show you how the arrow polynomial also detects this. And, and when we talk about Kovana homology a little more, we'll be able to see how theorems about Kovana homology will allow us to show that examples of this type are always non-trivial virtual. Where of this type means doing this kind of trick of flanking or crossing with virtual crossings. So arrow polynomial, uh, which uh, is uh, something that uh, Heather Dye and I found, but it's also part of uh, the constructions of Miyazawa and Naoko Kamada, whose name should also be in this list here. Um, it's an idea uh, that comes from, at least in the way I like to explain it to myself, it comes from trying to write down the oriented bracket and puzzling over the peculiarly disoriented vertex that occurs. So you see, if you wrote the expansion on an oriented diagram of the bracket, then you would smooth in an oriented way, but then you would smooth in a disoriented way like this with two arrows going into a point and two arrows leaving a point. Um, and you could still go ahead and do all your calculations and get the bracket polynomial. You would have states with peculiar orientations on them that you were ignoring, but you could also use it to keep track of writhe uh, in places where you wanted to keep track of it, so it would be useful. But the question arises, um, 
could we keep this combinatorial structure? Uh, could we hold on to it and take it all the way to the end and count something about it and make the invariant stronger? So that's a good question and we'll have to take a look. Well, this is the answer. <laughs> and I'll show you how that works. The answer is uh, that uh, for this method, we're going to allow that when a disoriented node occurs, uh, yeah. occurs in pairs, of course, occurs in pairs, and we're going to think of them as separate pairs in, in the resulting state diagram. You can pull those apart. You're not thinking of this as one node, but as two. Uh, I wrote a paper um, in which I wanted to think of this as one node of, of these as glued together and traced what would happen for invariance if I thought of this as one node. But it turns out that the only thing that comes out of that paper in the end uh, using the methods that I described, it's called extended bracket polynomial. You'll find it easily enough on the archive, for example. Um, and it's published in JKTR. The only thing that comes out of it is the arrow polynomial in the end. And I need to write a short paper explaining why that is the case. I may explain it uh, in these talks at some point. It takes about 15 minutes to explain why it, it actually goes over to just arrow. But we're talking about arrow today. So the cusps are free to move apart. I call these cusps. I keep drawing them this way because they are actually pointers to one side of the curve. When you see a cusp like this, it's a pointer to this side of that curve. If you had two cusps in a row like this, you would have one which, go, which is pointing to this side of the curve and the other is pointing to the other side of the curve. So with that understanding about the nature of cusps and notation for them, the rule turns out to be uh, that if you allow consecutive cusps that point to the same side to cancel, then you get invariant, then that's sufficient for invariance under the Reitermeister moves in the bracket formalism. You do not have to cancel zigzags. And you'll see why in a moment. But because you have this cancellation and not this one, you get some different states. You see, a state yeah, like this, uh, question? Uh, if you have a comment, you should open your mic, but if you don't have a comment, you should close your mic, right? The usual notion. Um, uh, here we have two consecutive cusps, and so they cancel. And so this loop is the same as the standard loop and will be so evaluated, the usual evaluation of a standard loop. On the other hand, this one with a virtual crossing, if you look at it carefully, you realize it's a zigzag. Why is it a zigzag? Well, um, this point, this cusp is pointing to this side of the curve. Walk along the curve and get to the other cusp. Ah, it's pointing to the other side of the curve. So this is a zigzag, and that's how you can tell if you're walking along the graph. If you rewrite it, um, you, can, you can do a detour on this state, and then you see that it's this as well. Um, and, um, and here's one um, with um, a cusp here, not drawn very cuspy, going outward, and an outward cusp there, and here's a cusp, and there's a cusp, and this one, turns out to be two zigzags. So when a state has a zigzag in it, a single zigzag, a state loop, it will be called K1. It's a new variable. If it has two zigzags that don't cancel, it'll be called K2 and so on. And so we have an infinite number of possible variables that can occur. And, and, and that's how this uh, invariant extends. It becomes an invariant with extra variables like these. Uh, there's a theorem about this invariant that we prove in our paper, which I won't prove here, but it's a good theorem and I'll mention it. I'll define the k degree of the resulting polynomial by saying that a kn, remember what a kn is, it has n zigzags. A kn has degree n, a ki has degree i. And if you have a product of them, then this degrees out. So 
The highest K degree of the arrow polynomial is a lower bound on its virtual crossing number, the least number of virtual crossings that it can handle in any diagram. And uh, you can find that either from the archive or, or find this JKTR paper. I might come back at some point and show you proof of that, but uh, not in this talk. Um, another thing about this formalism is that it's quite easy to program uh, because you see what you do to write a, a simple program in Mathematica, say, for calculating the bracket is you expand it into these two smoothings. And in the usual bracket, you call this a, a kind of generalized Kronecker delta, call this delta CB, and this one delta DA. And then that, mean, that means that if you start concatenating little bits like that, uh, they will obey the delta rules. Delta AB, delta BC is delta AC, and they are symmetric. So then you will, you will find the loops in the state and be able to evaluate them. And of course, you expand something like this, a symbol for a crossing into A times one kind of delta plus B times the other. In the case of arrow, you need a separate kind of delta, which I call LED, which is DEL backwards. And the LEDs satisfy some special rule uh, involving the ordering. So you see LEDAB, LEDBC will be equal to a delta. That's the cancellation. And you won't get the cancellation of the zigzags. Then you have to write down names for some of the elementary zigzags, and you just can proceed as usual and get a program that writes this polynomial. So this polynomial uh, is an easy one to compute in, in a computer program. Now, what about these funny states? Couldn't they occur in a classical knot diagram as well? And the answer is uh, not so. Um, what the problem is that you won't have any virtual crossings in a classical diagram. And so if you have a zigzag, I didn't draw, oh, here's one. If you had a zigzag in a classical diagram, it would have to look like this. Each of these is paired with somebody originally. And so this one would be paired with somebody who is now locked inside the diagram. And since they're all paired and this one is outside that loop, the other one has uh, an unpaired, at least one unpaired entity because of evenness. And that one unpaired entity will also have to be matched and you go into an infinite descent because of the Jordan curve theorem. So none of this can happen uh, in classical knot diagrams. You won't get any extra variables in classical knot diagrams. That means that if you calculate this invariant and you get some extra variables, you know that you have a non-trivial virtual knot that isn't classical. Luke, could I ask a question at this point, please? Sure. But these zigzagged components, do they also attract a D element within the arrow polynomial? Do it does test? not produce a, uh, by a D element, I assume you mean uh, Correct. Uh, Correct. an ordinary oh, loop. Squared. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no, no D element. So just a K1 or it's K1. It's just producing a K1, that's right. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the convention that I use. Somebody else might, uh, I, I, no, no, you better not do that. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll it will cause some confusion in your calculation. Okay. Leave this one alone as just a K1, but when, when it reduces, call it a D. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. So uh, now it's good to understand what's happening that the zigzags can live in virtuals. So let's go up to surface representation of some virtual and you see, oh, I see. I can certainly have a zigzag happening in the state of somebody that's living on a higher genus surface because the, the pairings can happen. There's there, the Jordan curve theorem doesn't work anymore. Uh, a loop doesn't necessarily divide the space into two pieces. And so zigzags can occur like that, for example. So well, let's uh, proceed now to take a look at how 
uh, we get invariance under Reitermeister moves and why these rules about canceling cusps are sufficient. So look, here's the simplest Reitermeister move, the standard oriented one. And if we expand according to our uh, method, we get two disoriented crossings here an ordinary smoothing and a disoriented one, two of them, and two ordinary smoothings over here. These three are the three that we need to cancel out so that we would get invariance under the Reitermeister move over to this guy. So, um, so the only uh, way that I know to get them to cancel um, in this framework would be to call this the usual delta. And then these three will then expand into a to the minus two, a squared, and a, a times a inverse, which is one, and delta uh, multiplied by the thing we want to go away. So we need that delta plus a squared plus a to the minus two is zero. And OK, good. That, that will work as long as this fellow here is decided to be delta. So, so far, the only thing that we need for invariance under this move is that this little character here with two outward cusps is equal to delta. Maybe that's all you need. We could follow it up and see, all right? But we go to the next move, we go to the reverse Reinemeister two move, and that expands this way, right? These two horizontals are ordinary smoothings. And then you get this little cusp, cusp, guy on a, on, a, on, a, on a little circuit like that, and you get another one of those. So, um, so you see, in order for this triplet to cancel, I need that the occurrence of a cusp and then the occurrence of a cusp on the same side must cancel out. Um, and um, uh, that when I say I need, of course, I'm saying that's sufficient. Uh, if those will cancel out, then we will get this triplet to cancel. And since I'm working in the separated cusps idea, um, uh, this becomes just any two cusps in consecutive occurrence along the diagram. Um, uh, there's nothing special about this. In my old musings, I was hoping that I could call this another special configuration and just cause this one to uh, smooth out, but that, that does not seem to be working. All right, but you could try again if you wanted to. You could try my old idea of keeping them in pairs and see what happens to you. But anyway, we see that now if we adopt the rule of consecutive cusps canceling, uh, then we'll have invariance under both Reitermeister moves. And notice that these are consecutive cusps, so we only need one rule so far. Um, Good. Now we go to the third Reitermeister move, and I will do it this way. Here's a lemma. If you have in the diagrams a cusp, and underneath that cusp goes a line, then uh, that line can be pulled out, but it acquires a zigzag like that. Notice that the zigzag is in the pairing form, going in, going out. This is associated with that, and there's another cusp up here which is of the same type as this one. So this is something that you could do in a larger diagram. This cusp might be associated with somebody else up there. It's still there, but this cusp is happening here. And similarly, uh, if the orientation went downward rather than upward. Uh, and the proof of this, the, the proof of this is to uh, expand it. So I've expanded here, A, A inverse, and then I expanded here, A, A inverse, and I expanded here, A, A inverse, and I look at the resulting four things that I've got. This is um, two consecutive cusps which cancel, and then you get two consecutive cusps that cancel. So this is just a smooth line going on up. Here's another smooth line going on up. This is a delta. Um, here's a little zigzag, uh, but here's a smooth line going on up. So you see that we have this triplet here. And this is, and now if you just do the arithmetic, you see that this triplet here, this one, this one, 
and this one cancels out. And you're left with this one. And that's the zigzag that emerges. So you see this zigzag didn't have to be canceled in order to emerge. And we're going to see that its emergence is all I need to get the third move in variance. Next slide. Here's third move. So uh, now it is sufficient in the presence of right in my question. Question? Yeah, could you go back one? This one or further back? Yeah, no, that's it. Um, uh, what What's happening with the A's when you look at that triplet? You get one with an A well, squared. Well, yeah, you get, um, you get an A squared, you get an A to the minus two, and you get A inverse delta. Ah, okay, okay, I, I missed the delta. Okay, thank you. You got it, right. Okay, so uh, now for the third Rademeister move, um, it is a fact that we can use one of the orientations of the third Rademeister move. We don't need both. In this case, I have the non-cyclic orientation as far as the triangle in the middle is concerned. That's enough in the presence of both Rademeister two moves. So, so this is good enough to prove, and this is the one that looks like braiding, uh, and it's good enough to prove invariance. So uh, I do it by the usual method of expanding on this crossing. And then you see I have one of those things that the lemma applies to, uh, a guy under crossing a cusp. So he pops up with a zigzag, but then that zigzag can get absorbed and push him up to the top because of both sides of the lemma. And now we put it back together. So, so you see the zigzags are okay. They don't have to be canceled in order to get invariance under the Reitermeister moves. And that's the proof that's my best proof at the moment of uh, invariance for the arrow polynomial. Okay, questions on that? Okay, uh, so uh, you can use it to detect some things about long knots as well if you wish, like you may have a long virtual like this and you expand it and get some, um, you can get some, uh, state curves, but you may also get some zigzags on a, on a long part, and you can keep track of them. So in this case, uh, in this calculation, uh, uh, it was only the long part that gave me something non-trivial. As it should be, right? This is an interesting example. The, the, oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. Um, we got uh, we got a K one here as well. Um, oh, I see. I'm using the other convention here, the one you asked about. Well, I don't like that other convention of calling it both D and K one. Um, all right. But um, um, let's look at this for a moment. There might be a mistake in the slide. Uh, this is a, a good example of a long because if you close it, it's a trivial knot, right? So here we have a K1 in this one and we have a zigzag in this one and they'd better cancel each other out. So if I were to close this, I'm getting a loop. And if I close this, I'm getting a K1. And that's where the cancellation is going to occur because there is, um, a, in the way this is set up, they're going to cancel each other out. And I'd better not start worrying about the details of this calculation because I see it worked in the, it was being done in the other convention that I just mentioned. But that's a good example anyway. You can do, you can, you can run this on long knots and on nontoids, which are a generalization of long knots by keeping track of the zigzag structure on the long states. What are some other examples? Here's a simple example of a, what we tend to call the virtual trefoil. And when you expand the virtual trefoil, you see you get some Ks. Here's a K, here's a K. Um, 
And so you end up getting non-trivial uh, arrow polynomial out of it. As you see, I, um, I, I should have thought carefully about which convention I was going to promote in this talk. I'm, I'm using the other convention in these calculations where I take a D for every one of those and I multiply by the extra variable. Uh, and here's the uh, one that has unit Jones polynomial. And as you see, it also has Ks in it, but I didn't show you all the states. And in this case, it has K1 squared. And by our theorem, that tells you that the virtual crossing number of this knot is greater than or equal to two. And since it has examples with two, I mean less than or equal to, uh, I mean the virtual crossing number is greater than or equal to two. And, and it has an example where it is two. And so the virtual crossing number is two. And here's Kishino. And Kishino also has appearances of K1 and even K2. And so Kishino is seen to be non-trivial by this invariant. And flat Kishino is also seen to be non-trivial by this invariant because if you were to uh, run this with A equal to one, uh, then you would still arrive at a non-trivial polynomial with some Ks in it. And in fact, with a degree 2K. So Kashino also has crossing number equal, virtual crossing number equal to two. So that's a quick introduction to arrow polynomial. Questions? Do the Ks have something to do with a basis for the first homology or half a basis for the first homology? Of the surface on which the knot is represented? Yes. I'll have to think about that. I mean, you see that we're getting non-trivial homology elements, but how independent they are is another matter. After all, crossing number can be very high while the homology remains low. I'm sure I can give you an example because of that, where the, the K degrees are, are also high. Uh, but the genus of the knot is just one, uh, so that the homology is staying down at uh, at rank two, but the, uh -huh. there are a lot of Ks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's worth thinking about. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that the next time. Other questions? I think Arrow is a very interesting extension of the uh, Jones polynomial. Um, it's um, it's very close to what you what happens when you start when one first starts to think about the bracket because of that idea of or of expanding in an oriented way. Um, and so I I look back and I saw that in my old notes uh, related to bracket I was doing this, but I didn't have the idea of virtual knots and it didn't occur to me that. Uh, this might have some something to do with surfaces. Uh, but it, as you see, it has a lot to do with the surfaces. And on the other hand, it can be formulated without the surfaces. So it's natural to ask, and I didn't include any slides here or examples, but maybe we should come back to it. Uh, you can do this perfectly well for um, knots in a thickened surface. Just choose your knots to be in a thickened surface. Um, and then uh, the states can have cusps in them uh, and you have a generalization of the bracket polynomial uh, that doesn't have to worry about the isotopy classes of the loops, but is keeping track of the, of the cusps. Or you can keep track of the isotopy classes of these loops as well as their cusp structure 
and get a stronger invariant for the knot in a surface. And if you want it to be an invariant of virtual knots, then you can say, all right, what is happening here um, if I were to stabilize, if I were to add a handle to the surface? Um, or, I mean, there are a number of different things you can do. Or you can say, I will use, I will assume that I'm working in a minimal genus surface that supports the virtual knot. Then by Cooperberg, that's good. You're really talking about the virtual knot if you use the minimal genus. But then you have to think about the topology of the knot in the surface, including game twists to move it around to different positions. So you have to think about what the isotopy classes of the loops, how they change, how things change when you apply game twists to the surface. And you can keep track of the arrow structure as well and get a stronger invariant than the surface bracket that way. So there are lots of um, variations of this that are useful. So I think it's probably worth coming back to the arrow at some point and saying more, but that's all I wanted to say about it today. Other questions about it? Okay, uh, a comment about this slideshow, which I keep accumulating and putting uh, in the Dropbox. This slideshow now contains more about the functional integral approach to the knot invariant. Uh, and it contains one thing that I thought I might show you if I can quickly find it that I thought was interesting. Let me find it. Yeah. Um, a while back, remember, I, I was telling you that, um, uh, that the uh, people doing loop quantum gravity back in the 90s, uh, Smolin and Rovelli, uh, they had the idea of defining a kind of generalized transform, uh, which goes like this. You have some function of a gauge field and you'll integrate it over all gauge fields against the Wilson loop evaluated on that gauge field. Now that isn't their idea, that's Witten's idea where he took a specific function of a gauge field, the exponentiated turn Simons Lagrangian. But these fellows said, oh, well, let's think of this as a kind of Fourier transform that takes you from functions on fields to functions on knots. And then if you have a differential operator on it, which you often have on uh, that you need to apply to your function on a gauge field, because they're doing physics with functions on gauge fields, why it will transform to a differential operator on the, uh, on the integrated thing, but then you could integrate by parts and shift the operator over to the Wilson loop. And so then you would have operations on things related to knots and you could, you could take a look at what some differential equation that's supposed to be true about this would say about these integrals with re in relation to knots. And they call that the loop transform. So then they found, and this is where I'm adding two, I'm adding one extra thing here just for your amusement. They have two basic differential operators in their theory. One is uh, this G. We're, now, this just means summing with these coefficients, you know, um, and um, that's the curvature tensor. And this one, the, well, this one is called the diffeomorphism constraint, and this one is called the Hamiltonian constraint. And uh, this is supposed to uh, make the function of the gauge field vanish. So they did the uh, mathematical experiment of transforming these uh, operators. So for example, you can take the diffeomorphism constraint operator and there it is, integrated uh, G psi and do right integration by parts and apply it to a Wilson loop. And then you look by using the yoga that we had talked about, um, what this does to a Wilson loop. And 
uh, by gum, it does the algebraic thing to the Wilson loop that corresponds to deforming it by a small amount. So that means that this, that the vanishing of this would correspond to the uh, topological invariance uh, of the resulting not invariant, the integral of psi against the Wilson loop. So, so they uh, were very happy with this because it meant, for example, that the, if you took the Chern-Simons Lagrangian, then it would be a solution. The exponentiated Chern-Simons Lagrangian would be a solution to their systems of equations. And, um, and just for the heck of it, I thought I would tell you the rest of the short story. The Hamiltonian constraint, the other one, when you, when you shift it over to the Wilson loop and apply it, and there was a, uh, I'm not doing the detail here. Oh, but there's the epsilon. So you see there is this epsilon and this epsilon is anti-symmetric. And here you have the curvature tensor, which is not going to live under an anti-symmetric insertion of this kind uh, in this form of the algebra. And so it goes away. And so the Hamiltonian constraint was automatically satisfied for them up to some technicalities that had to be worried about. So that was the loop, that was the loop quantum gravity theory as it interacted with this integration idea. And, and so I thought uh, for the sake of, an, of talking about that, that it would be nice to have a little more information here about the loop quantum gravity, but I, I'm not going to give a talk about it, but I have written a set of slides that summarizes this summary paper from 1990 or thereabouts by Jorge Poulin. Uh, so you will find in the notes a summary of the summary paper. Uh, and that uh, you might find amusing to look at to try to understand what was going on in their theory. We provided most of the nuts and bolts about using the functional integral and the other side of the coin is what they do, which is they start from the equations of general relativity and talk about how to do the quantization and so on. So there's some technicalities here, but you might find this interesting to look at and it's now in the slideshow. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about that, that it's in the slideshow. Um, if, I, if I found myself with a good way to talk about this uh, that was concise. I might come back and try. Uh, these relations with the physics, as you see, go, go on out and over many years go on out into lots of things like Mina Anagogic's uh, string theory. And in that case, it's certainly better to hear from some of those practitioners. Maybe we could also hear from some loop quantum gravity practitioners at some point. So that's that. And now I want to talk about Kobana phomology. So for this purpose, I'm going to reformulate the bracket a little bit. This is Kovana homology from the ground up, okay? I'm just going back to the bracket and I'm going to construct everything as I go. Um, so we have the bracket expansion, but you'll notice that I have um, rewritten it as Kovanov did. Um, I, um, have a single Q here, and I have the value of the loop is equal to Q plus Q inverse. This would be the same as um, multiplying the entire bracket by power of A, which would get a power of A inverse, which would get rid of these A's and have some A squareds over here, and then you use a different variable Q. So that A squared being Q, the value of the loop is Q plus Q inverse. It has no sign. This is much better for bookkeeping. 
remember we have a minus q here. And now you have a nice exercise, which you ought to do, uh, which is to examine how this behaves under Reitermeister moves and find out that it no longer is invariant under all the Reitermeister moves, that, it, that you get some little factors coming in, but that you can normalize them right back away by multiplying by this, which is minus one to the number of um, crossings uh, with rive contribution negative uh, times Q to the N plus minus two N minus. That indicates that the little loop uh, in the first Reitermeister move behaves differently under a plus and a minus crossing. So you should do the exercise and summarize it for yourself by seeing that this is now the invariant polynomial. Okay, so with that, we can then, and we could have done this with the bracket as well, but it's, it's convenient to use this bookkeeping. With that, um, we can extend the states a bit so that uh, the polynomial is expressed by the state summation as a sum of monomials. Very simple idea due to Vero. Um, the idea is that we will label each state loop with a plus or a minus. And then instead of having Q plus Q inverse as the value of that state loop, I'm going to take Q for the one labeled plus and Q inverse for the one labeled minus. And then uh, instead of having powers of Q plus Q inverse happening when you expand the bracket, a state will be a collection of loops that are labeled plus and minus, and you will get a power of Q from that. And then you will get some other Qs, minus Qs, uh, from the B type smoothings. I continue to call this an A type smoothing and that a B type smoothing. So you see, the, you would then have that the, that the bracket is the sum over these enhanced states of minus one to the I of S, Q to the J of S, where the minus one is the number of B smoothings, because that's the only place where a minus sign happens in your state. And J is going to be the sum of the contributions from the plus and minuses on the loops and the number of B smoothings. So, uh, that's great. You now have a sum of monomials. You have a, an imaginary form of the polynomial that you can look at directly. This is also useful if you're interested in thinking about what's the highest degree, what's the lowest degree, how are terms canceling in the bracket. You have it as a theoretical form, as a sum of monomials. You can think about all those things. But we're heading toward Kovana homology, so I'm going to say it this way that I will take a module. Uh, could you, yeah, could you just repeat, repeat the definition of J? I have a bad internet connection. Okay, J is what it has to be, right? Q is contributing, right? And right. how is Q contributing? It contributes from uh, plus and minus uh, labels on state loops, but it also contributes from B smoothings. So okay. therefore, J is what it has to be, which is the sum of the number of plus loops minus the number of minus loops plus the number of B smoothings. Great. I'm sure I wrote it in the next slide. And what determines whether a loop is a plus or a minus? I'm sorry? What determines if a loop is a plus or a minus? Um, um, choice because you have to go through all possible choices. So if you had a given state in the old form, it gets sprinkled with all the different possible pluses and minuses that it can have. Like this state, this state gets sprinkled with a plus and it also gets sprinkled with a minus. It bifurcates into two states. If you had two loops uh, without any, um, in anything in between them, just two disjoint loops, then there would be four possible enhanced states, plus, 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 minus, minus, plus, minus, minus. Got it. And if you think of adding them all up, their contributions, you get Q squared, one for the plus minus, one for the plus minus, and minus two, which is Q to the minus two for the other one. So you get Q plus two plus Q to the minus two, 
And that, of course, is Q plus Q inverse squared. Algebra in your head. Well, maybe I wrote it on the next slide. But I want to talk about the strategy before I do that. And the strategy is going to be to turn some things into modules that might be chain complexes. And so here, I'm going to take the module which is generated by the states S with a given I and a given J. Okay? And that means all terms, the, so that module collects up all the states that contribute minus one to the I, Q to the J. There may be a multiplicity of them that contribute that same term. And, uh, and that will be multiplied by the dimension of CIJ. So, so far, all I've done is said, oh, I could turn it into an actual polynomial with coefficients. And this would be the coefficient, minus one to the I, dimension of CIJ. That'll be the coefficient where this is just counting the number of states that have that property. But as you know, um, uh, with malice aforethought, this is going to be the chain complex entity. Uh, this is going to turn out to be, uh, the, it's going to turn out that the chain complex is generated by these enhanced states. And we're going to have a boundary mapping to find on these guys, but that's getting ahead of our story. So yes, I have a slide here illustrating how the binomial theorem works in terms of plus and minuses labeling something. This state here becomes this collection of enhanced states and the evaluation of it is indeed Q plus Q inverse squared. Okay. Um, now, here's a knot. Um, here are the states of the knot. And Kovanov's beautiful idea is to put some order in those states and then see it as a category. So quite natural once, once you look at it that way. Um, there's the states with three A's and there's the states with three B's and there are the states with some number of B's and some number of A's. So I've ordered it from left to right, all A's, one B, two Bs, three Bs. And I run an arrow between two states if you can change one into the other by re-smoothing some crossing, making it have one more B. So this is a re-smoothing arrow. That's a re-smoothing arrow. Every arrow you're looking at is a re-smoothing arrow. The structure of the states as a whole is then a cube. Uh, with and These are not the enhanced states. These are just the states. Um, so what each vertex of the cube is one of the one of the states, and and you can put it abstractly by saying you have n a's and you can change one of the a's to a b, you can change another a to a b, you can change another a to a b, and you get pathways going on down. So these are ordered arrows. This is a category. This little guy here is a category. Uh, in fact, it's a category where I have to add very few extra morphisms in order to really make it into a category. Of course, I have to add some morphisms. There is the identity morphism at every node, which I shan't write. And then I've indicated generating morphisms for the rest of the category. This arrow and this arrow together give rise to a composite arrow here. Um, and, um, and the simplest category that I can associate with a cube in this way we'll have commuting squares. So this should be, this composition should be the same as this composition. Um, I can consider- is, uh, is there an arrow missing at the bottom? There usually is an arrow missing in most of the things I ever drew. You're right, there's an arrow missing right okay. there. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll stick that in the next time I'm in the uh, place where I can draw it. So you have a category. Um, and then the next idea uh, for doing Kovana homology could be to jump to say, well, categories have cohomologies, or why don't we take the cohomology of the nerve of this category with coefficients in something? Uh, and in fact, that's what he is doing, but he's uh, doing something that's computationally just a shade more clever than that. And 
and it's because of the structure of the cube. Because you see, you have three arrows going to this next stage, 1B, and then you have a bunch of arrows going to the next stage, 2Bs, and a bunch of arrows going to the next stage, 3Bs. So, uh, so in fact, what he does is he associates one module to each of these, and then he takes the direct sum of these modules along the vertical for a given number of Bs. And that becomes that stage in the complex. So you go from no Bs to 1B to 2Bs to 3Bs, and that's the chain complex. Direct sum of these, direct sum of these, direct sum of all the columns uh, as you go along. And so we have to explain, if we want to show a definition of this kind, how to associate a module to each of these individual states, and then how to define a boundary map. Well, I already told you how to find the module. The module is generated by the, enha by the enhanced states. That's the dictum. So each enhanced state is going to be a, a generator for the chain complex. It itself is a generator for the chain complex. So um, in this case, there are two generators. In this case, there are two. In this case, there are two. But over here, there are four. Four generators coming from here. Plus, minus, minus, plus, and so on. <clears throat> and over here, eight. I seem to have a repeating slide. We don't need to do anything with that. But now, suppose that you had a boundary mapping. And here's what Kovanov constructs, and we'll see it in a moment. I should keep track of my time. Maybe five more minutes, and then we'll quit. We're going to quit in the middle here, but we could get to the definition. Um, Kovanov found, and we will find, that you can define a boundary mapping which increases the i. That means one more b. But it leaves the j fixed. We'll see that. And because it leaves the j fixed, that means that that becomes a special grading, and there's really as many homologies as there are values of j. And that means there's going to be a jth homology. And if you took our uh, formula here, here it is, this formula, and rewrote it as a sum over j and then a sum over i, which is uh, perhaps the good reason why I repeated the slide, you see, this is our formula, which was just counting how many uh, states had this contribution. But I'm going to rewrite it as a sum over j, sum over i. And then you recognize that this looks like an Euler. This is the Euler characteristic of that. If it were a complex, it's going to be a complex. Here's the Euler characteristic as a function of j. And if j is left invariant, then you have the jth complex. You're going to have one complex for every j. And uh, and then if homology is actually defined, this will be, by the usual bit of homological algebra, equal to the or the characteristic of the homology, the alternating sum of the dimensions of the homology. And so we will find, if we produce a homology theory, that the bracket polynomial is equal the coefficients of the bracket polynomial are the Euler characteristics of those homologies. And so we have found a geometric interpretation in terms of that homology of the coefficients of the Jones polynomial. Quite amazing that this formalism is fitting together that way. And so here we're going to go back to the J. Um, um, so, um, so I'm saying that I want J to be fixed. Um, and if J is to be fixed, remember J, what? Was there a question? Remember what J was. J is the number of Bs plus the sum of the number of plus loops minus the number of minus loops, which I'm now calling lambda for convenience. If J is to be fixed, then, uh, uh, then since boundary will take the lambda to 
that then we need that boundary should subtract one from lambda because we're adding one in the J. So that's what I need to have. I need that the number of plus loops minus the number of minus loops should go down by one when I form a boundary operator. But I haven't told you what the boundary operator is. We have just time to indicate that how to get to the boundary operator and then we'll quit. Well, there's more to do. We'll start next time. But here we are at lambda equals two with two pluses and we're trying to define a boundary operator. That means we have to create when we bring these together, this is an A smoothing, turns into a B smoothing, the two loops turn into one loop. This has to be labeled with pluses and minuses. Lambda is two, you've got to get lambda equal to one. The only possibility is plus. So that's the definition of the boundary mapping in that restricted instance. Two pluses go to one plus. A plus and a minus is lambda equals zero. And that will have to go to a label minus. So that's what happens under lambda equals zero. And two minuses, lambda equals minus two, I'd have to get down to lambda equals minus three. I can't, so I call it zero. Now you look at the pattern of this and you see that it looks like a multiplication with plus being the identity and minus being something that's not the identity. And so we're going to let minus be called x and one be called plus. And then this says that x times x equals zero. One times one is one, one times x is x times one is x. And the rule for the boundary is multiply. And that's what happens when the two loops become one loop. When, when one loop becomes two, same considerations. Here's a lambda equals minus one. I'm using x for minus one now. And I, it becomes two loops. This has to be minus two. The only way I can do that is to double the x. And on the other hand, when it's one and it has to go to zero, then I can label the two loops one and x or x and one. So I take their sum. And that means that at the algebra level, the co-product that this is, is x tensor x on x and one tensor x plus x tensor one in the other case. This turns out to be exactly the boundary mapping that we need, extended of course. These are on the special cases of little loops interact. And so therefore implicitly, we have now defined Kovana homology and I'll stop and continue next time. Uh, I believe I'm unshared. Roger, are you there to uh, finish our process? There you are. There you are, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lou. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I was silent. Um, that's quite a good state to be in, I suppose. Um, are there any questions? I should mention, if you haven't seen Kovana homology, hard to imagine that you haven't, but um, the paper by Kovana, for the original one, is very interesting to look at in the light of all the things that happened since. Mm. And the, er, on the early papers of Drawer are still just wonderful to look at. They're elegant and very much to the point. Mm. Sure. Okay, so uh, nobody wants to ask a question. Um, now, what's happening next Friday? Um, I don't think we've got a, a volunteer for next Friday. Maybe we'll get Minna. Yeah, maybe. Well, watch this space is all yeah. I can say. <laughs> um, but you're going to continue next Tuesday, Lou, is that correct? I plan to, unless yeah. someone else wants to. Oh, no, that sounds speak. good. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop recording now.